Our scripture tonight is taken from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. As I was working on this sermon, I came across one commentator who claimed that all parables are odd, but Matthew's parables are really odd, and in that odd bunch, this one stands out. So we're in for some fun, right? Okay, so you know that uh, Jesus is, uh, this is a parable, and, and Jesus is using metaphors, as he often does, to explain a greater reality. In this story, just here are the basics. There are 10 young women, and this they're called bridesmaids in the NRSV. It's night, they each have a lamp that burns oil for light so that they can see where they're headed, going from one place to another. They're meeting someone on the way, and the person they intend to meet is running later than expected, and so the women in the story have to wait. Five of the women came prepared with extra lamp oil, and five just came with the oil in their lamps, and because of the unexpected wait, those who came with just the oil in the lamps are gonna run out of oil, and in this parable, that is a really, really bad thing. Okay, so where I think we often get stuck with this particular scripture is the idea that those who brought extra lamp oil refused to share it with those who are about to run out. And instead, they suggest these women go to town and buy oil. And we're thinking, well, that doesn't seem right. That's not very loving. But see, that's where we have to remember that this is a parable. And lamp oil in this is not lamp oil. It represents something else. And what if the lamp oil, clearly of great importance in this story, represents something that cannot possibly be shared? Out of respect for the gospel, would you stand as you are comfortable and listen for the word of God? This is from Matthew 25. <clears throat> then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, um, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. Lord. You may be seated. So this time of year, as we gradually are gradually approaching the season of Advent, the four weeks that lead up to Christmas, it's just sort of standard for me to have some really wonderful memories from my youth begin to present themselves in a fairly powerful way. When I went, when I was in junior high, it was junior high, not middle school, seventh through ninth, and then high school was tenth through twelfth. So from seventh through twelfth grade. I remember the month of December being particularly special. Starting in seventh grade, I remember during the month of December, I started taking walks at night through my neighborhood three to four times a week alone, and it was perfectly safe. I don't want, didn't want anybody getting distracted by that. It was perfectly safe. My mom, the first couple times I did this, she said to me, are you, are you going with a friend? And I said, no. Are you going by yourself? I said, yes. I wanted to go by myself. I, I really wanted no conversation. And so I grew up in central Iowa, so I bundled up to take these walks. People in central Iowa know how to dress, right? 
Everybody has at least one super warm winter coat that is not at all flattering. Everybody has at least one pair of boots that are really, really practical and work really great in the snow and the ice. And you got the hat and you got the gloves and you got the scarf. And the thing is you get all this on and you can walk outside in really cold weather and you can enjoy yourself. It's wonderful. So I would take these walks for about a half an hour and I mean, yes, there were outdoor Christmas lights on people's houses, and that was kind of fun to see those. And people had decorated Christmas trees, and, you know, they would have them like in the front picture window with the curtains open, you know, you were supposed to look in through the window and see their beautiful trees. But the thing that really got my attention was the sky. And I know there had to be cloudy nights, but those aren't the ones I remember. I remember the sky, I remember this blue-black clear sky with these, in, this beautiful, these beautiful, bright, just twinkling stars. And because it was Iowa, and it starts to snow in October and doesn't end until February, there was always some snow on the ground. And it left a kind of a, a muffled quiet. You know what I'm talking about? This kind of muffled quiet. And it was wonderful. It was a kind of a magical time. I think it was probably a mystical time, but I wouldn't have used those words to describe it. And it was only in December, because after December, the spell was broken. And I didn't know it at the time, but looking back from this perspective, I know I was having a holy experience every time I took a walk at night during the month of December. I didn't know it, but this was called Advent. And it won't be long before we enter into the season of Advent, the four weeks leading up to this time of preparation. And during that time of preparation, what are we preparing for? Well, one thing we're preparing for is the birth of the Christ child, right? We're preparing for Christmas and all the preparations at home and all the preparations at church. And it's hectic, but it's this really delightful time of year as we prepare for Christmas. But that's not the only thing we're preparing for in the season of Advent. What else are we preparing for? Well, we're supposed to be also preparing for the return of Christ. Okay, well, that promises to be a whole different experience, right? From the birth of Christ at Christmas to the end of life as we know it. What should, what, how should we spend our time during the season of Advent? Preparing for the return of Christ during those four weeks doesn't get a whole lot of attention, and that's not surprising. But you know, I was thinking, what if we did? What if we prepared for the return of Christ during that time? with the same kind of fervor that we prepare for the coming of the Christ child at Christmas. I mean, that's almost impossible to imagine. But let's, let's pretend. Just come along with me. Let's pretend. Say that we've received some pretty reliable information. And of course, no one knows the day or the time. But we've received some pretty reliable information. It looks like Christ may be returning sometime in 2018. Ho, ho, ho. What? 2018. Christ might be returning in 2018. Boy, that would be a wake-up call. Would it not? I mean, seriously, loosen up. Yes, it's probably not really going to happen in 2018, but I mean, how wild would that be? I mean, <laughs> what would you start doing differently starting now? What are you doing now that you would stop, and what are you not doing now that you would start? I mean, think about it. Would your life look similar to what it looks like now? Or different? Or somewhere in between? I think most of you are probably familiar with the name Augustine of Hippo. He was born in 354 AD, or Common Era. He was a theologian and philosopher whose writings influenced the development of Western Christianity and philosophy. And in reference to our scripture tonight, he argued that both the wise and foolish women in tonight's scripture represented members of the church, male and female, but that the wise women, the ones with enough lamp oil, were members of the church who practiced enduring love. 
meaning ones who practiced or lived out love of God and love of neighbor. And Augustine went on to describe the unprepared women as members of the church, male and female, all ages, who were interested primarily in mere appearances. And they were even foolish enough to believe that works of charity could be purchased. As if you could hire someone to love God and love neighbor for you. They believed that the appearance of charity, the appearance of loving neighbor, was all that was really necessary. And one of the most popular suggestions regarding the oil in the lamps is that it represents good works. It represents acts of charity. It represents genuine love of neighbor. And this stems from Jesus' words earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, on the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We cannot pay someone to love our neighbor for us. We cannot borrow or purchase or ride the coattails of someone else's love of neighbor. And they cannot give it to us even if they really wanted to. So think about this. What do you believe is the purpose of your life in this world at this time? What do you believe is the purpose of your life in this world at this time? Are you living it out? Is it related in any way to love of God and love of neighbor? the most important commandments. Are you living it out or are you waiting? One of my favorite authors, Anne Lamott, uh, in her book, Traveling Mercies, writes about waiting in another way. She writes, Our preacher Veronica said recently that this is life's nature that lives and hearts get broken. Those of people we love and those of people we'll never meet. She said that the world sometimes feels like the waiting room of an emergency ward and that we who are more or less okay for now need to take the tenderest possible care of the more wounded people in the waiting room until the healer comes. And she wraps it with, you sit with people, she said. You bring them juice and graham crackers. In other words, keep it simple. Loving neighbor can be simple. You know, we're in a waiting room of life, and we're family. And it's our responsibility to be caring for those who are not doing as well. Maybe it's juice and crackers. Maybe it's hand-holding or listening or sheltering or playing with or teaching or looking after children or youth or elderly or the lonely or the sick or praying with or helping to build or clean or move or store or whatever it is. When it comes to our faith, it's not okay to just sleepwalk through our lives, and somehow expect others to do the loving thing for us. Because even if they wanted to, they can't. Another author that I enjoy and read every morning is Frederick Buechner. He's an American writer and a theologian. And he writes, Our happiness is all mixed up with each other's happiness, and our peace with each other's peace. Our own happiness, our own peace can never be complete until we find some way of sharing it with people who, the way things are now, have no happiness and know no peace. Jesus calls us 
to show this truth forth, live this truth forth. Be the light of the world, he says. Where there are dark places, be the light, especially there. Be truly alive. Be life givers to others. That is what Jesus tells the disciples to be. That is what Jesus tells his church, tells us to be and do. It is as simple as that. What do you believe is the purpose of your life? in this world, at this time? How do you let your little light shine? Not just for the sake of others, but for your own sake. It matters. Thanks be to God. Amen.